Okay, um, this is the second video about cluster analysis. And like we talked about in the first video, um, the idea of clustering is that it's an unsupervised technique to try to find naturally occurring clusters in our data. Um, it's sort of a different technique than the model building that we talked about before, things like regression, cart, or random forest, in that we don't know what the right answer is before we start. So cluster algorithms are really a different kind of analysis. And as I talked about in that video, we aren't really going into depth about how they work. We're just trying to give you a taste of it so that when you do see it later, or if you do find yourself uh, running into some clusters that you at least have some idea of what they do. Um, in the first one, we talked about k-means clustering, which was uh, one method of clustering. And the second technique, which we call hierarchical clustering, it instead uh, looks at pairwise comparisons between our data. So rather than thinking about um, how the clusters naturally form, we instead think about um, how each point relates to a cluster and then we build it from there. These are also called tree clusters because the thing that it makes looks kind of like a tree. So um, here's our same data set that we used last time, our six points. And what we do is we think about how close each point is to the point that it's closest to. So the two closest points are points two and three and the distance between them is the height of that graph. Um, then we can uh, see how close that point is to the next point, which is point one. And that's again, a unit of about one away, one in a little bit. And that gives us our next point. Then as we look for the next closer points, these three are close to each other. Well, now our next closest point is five and six. So one being close to three was cool but five being close to six is the next closest one. So we connect five and six on the graph. Four is now next furthest away. It's about two away, a little bit less. And you see that distance here. So now these three are connected and these three are connected. And then we connect the points from each one of these um, to the other points. And again, where this gets useful and interesting isn't in a two dimensional graph, um, a roadmap uh, distance measure. But as you think about things where you have lots and lots of variables, lots and lots of uh, observations, and we want to make sort of a fancier calculation between those. Now, I will mention there's different ways of measuring distance. Um, in the one that I did, I was looking at the um, average distance. So I used what was called average linkage. In single linkage, you would have said connect the shortest distance between the two points. So as we're connecting one to this group, we would connect one directly to three. Up here, we'd connect four to six rather than to the midpoint. There's another technique called complete linkage, which is where you look for how the farthest distance away is. Okay, and again, if you look for the minimum distance between points when we're combining the two groups, we would compare it from here to here. If we're doing the maximum, we would look at the farthest one. And if we're looking for the average ones, we would calculate all the distances and calculate the average between them. Um, and so again, the height of the tree is the distance between these two clusters and with complete um, linkage we could do that. Now what's cool about it is rather than saying how many clusters we have at the beginning, in this case we had two um, sort of natural clusters, but however far you come down on the chart you can now make two categories if you stop here. If you go down to here you get three categories. If you go a little farther you get four. And so once your tree is made you can decide how many categories are useful. That's very different than k-means clustering where you couldn't really tell before um, you figured out um, how many groups you wanted to start with. Um, <clears throat> and so um, that's a real advantage of hierarchical clustering. And um, you know, again, this idea of how many clusters are natural, in this case because the branches are long in here, it makes sense to snip there somewhere and you would end up with two clusters. All right, so I mentioned that there would be dinosaurs. And what I wanted to talk about is one of the main uh, historical uses of dendrograms, which are what these are called tree uh, charts or hand charts, um, and these branching techniques. So um, this is um, sort of um, one of the oldest uh, uses of this. And this is actually used um, in the 1930s. This is actually data from Gregor Mendel, the um, flower guy, the guy who talked about genetics, and he was looking at the physical characteristics of these three different kinds of irises. 
and you can see the names of the irises there. And if you measure all these uh, different things, each plant, there were 50 each of three kinds of plants, and they were looking for which ones kind of naturally clump together. Can we predict which flowers go from which species? Um, and so um, you can see here that a lot of the blue uh, setosas, which is one of the species, they're all very close to each other. And in fact, you can perfectly get all of the blue uh, samples, the blue uh, specimens, uh, to be separate from all of the other ones because these blue uh, things all cluster with each other. But as you're looking at the green and the red, what we see is that they overlap a little bit. So virginica and versicolor, which are two other species of irises, um, you couldn't really using these physical characteristics. And so what they did was they literally measured the distance between uh, the different parts of the plant, how long it is, the ratios between them and that sort of thing. And what you see is that these two don't cluster neatly together. And um, biology applications of this are actually, again, very historical. Charles Darwin drew them. You've all seen the tree of life they talk about in uh, middle school biology classes about uh, the different uh, orders and, and families and stuff. So I'm gonna talk a second about two of those. Um, the first one I wanna talk about is um, about carnivora. Now carnivora is an order of mammals. Um, it includes lots of things you like, including cats and dogs and bears. Um, it's called carnivora because most of the animals in it are carnivorous, they eat other meat. Um, but they aren't literally carnivores. There are lots of things that are carnivores that aren't in carnivora and even some species of carnivora that aren't carnivorous. Um, but anyway, um, if you were my age when you were in school, you would have had a chart that kind of looks like this. This one came out in the late 80s, early 90s. And what it does is it splits every uh, big category in carnivora. And it uses, rather than the general distances, it talks about how many years since the species split. And um, this was done using fossil records and it was done using um, a bunch of other things. And what you would see here is in carnivora, the first split that was found was bears. And so bears split off first and then it went into several categories, some of which aren't very bear-like, such as seals and walruses. So the first split is bears. And then what we're left with is a subcategory that includes dogs and dog-like things, <clears throat> and then cats and cat-like things. And so um, this question of how we would split things off um, worked pretty well. And um, you can really see how um, these work. But now that we have protein uh, analysis and we have DNA analysis, uh, some of these have been sort of uh, scooched around. So rather than talking about the bear split, instead what we talk about is that cats formed one branch and dogs and bears formed a second branch. And um, again, this can't be done as quickly with the millions of years ago. Instead, it's done using um, kind of very fancy, this is an article from the um, National Academy of Sciences, this article is from 2002. And uh, the charts that are in this are actually pretty complicated and hard to read. You can zoom in on it. Um, but um, these uh, distances, rather than being millions of years ago, are percent of DNA or percent of mitochondrial proteins that are shared. Don't ask me too many questions about those because I don't actually know the details of how that works. Um, so, Again, here you can see that based off of this, cats are quite separate from the others and dogs and bears are now smooshed together um, because they have more DNA and more proteins in common. Um, interestingly, raccoons are now put in with bears. That wasn't the case over here, or maybe they just weren't, no raccoons were up here, I don't know. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> you can then go in and zoom a little bit further. If you zoom into cats, you can see um, kind of the different kinds of cats, and you can see which ones are closer to domestic cats. One reason they think uh, cats were domesticated in um, um, Europe is because they do have this close relationship with these European wild cats, separate from the big cats, and separate from um, these sort of medium-sized ones, 
cheetahs, cougars, bobcats, ocelots. And again, um, this chart, I mean, looks very much like those dendrograms we were drawing. Um, and so we can now um, check things out in these new ways, looking at bears. Uh, oops, that's not the one. Oh, we can see. Okay, maybe they don't have a, I thought they had a follow up chart of that. Nope, those are new cats and mongooses. Anyway, um, this is the sort of thing, if you did want to Google it, you could lose all day checking these out. And so I just wanted to finish with a quick um, look at uh, dinosaurs. Now, um, as we think about dinosaurs, um, certainly they're a thing, you know, kids like to talk about, things like to think about. And one of the things that's sort of interesting if you ever go to a museum is people always want to remind you that pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. And so you might say, gosh, what's the word for things that are dinosaurs and pterodactyls? And it turns out that there's the word archosaur, although that includes crocodiles and alligators, or ornithrodorians, ornithodirans, um, which are these bird-like archosaurs, as opposed to the modern reptile um, alligators and crocodiles. Um, and what you can see is pterosaurs split off sometime after that. And then there are these uh, sort of eight kinds of uh, dinosaurs listed. Eight kinds if you count birds as one of those eight kinds, modern birds. But there were the horned ones, uh, the dome-headed ones, the duckbills, the ones with armor like Ankylosaurus and Stegosaurus, the sauropods, the real big ones like uh, Brontosaurus or Apatosaurus. Um, another thing you'll learn in the museum is a brontosaurus isn't a real dinosaur. Um, prosauropods, and then theropods, which includes things like velociraptors and tyrannosaurs, and birds. And so um, they made these actually, you know, 100 years ago, looking at differences in bones, looking at how skeletons um, look together. Um, and um, in fact, uh, this web page that I pulled up, which I just Googled, uh, talks about how you can uh, take a turkey and turn it into a dinosaur. Um, but anyway, this idea of how to make these dendrograms is using this same idea of cluster analysis that we're talking about, but it's using a very specific kind of thing, looking at these similarities. And then, like I said, in the one case, looking at similarity of DNA and proteins or looking at uh, when in evolutionary history the animals might have split. Um, and so this idea that all birds are actually this end of this tree, um, which the next living relatives are crocodiles and alligators, but all of these other kinds of dinosaurs are here in the middle, um, is sort of the place I want to end up. One last thing is that because of the way uh, we make these charts, you can't really tell whether, for instance, three is closest to four, or could you flip it? Because in practice, one is actually closest to six. But because we're really looking at these linkages, um, it's not necessarily the case that one will be on that side of the tree and six will be on that side of the tree. So um, this has been just a quick introduction to cluster analysis. Again, um, I might ask some simple questions on the final or something about it, but it's not really something you're going to do a homework on or anything. It's really much more about just having a little bit of experience with uh, sort of this cool part of data science that we aren't going to get into much in this class. If you are interested in this STAT 420, which is an upper level class, it's called uh, Data Mining and Multivariate Statistics, it'll look at these in much more detail. All right.